Okay, I want to welcome everyone to the Lunar and Planetary Lab Evening Lecture Series, the last of our three lectures for the fall. My name is Tim Swindle. I'm the director of the Lunar and Planetary Lab. And I appreciate everybody coming out on Thanksgiving weekend. Get a little bit of uh, science before you eat, some, eat your turkey on Thursday. Uh, I did want to announce a few things. One, uh, if we've got students in the audience who need to have notes signed or stamped or something like that, we will have someone in the back and someone in the front stamping them afterwards. So uh, there will be someone to do that for you. Then uh, a bunch of upcoming events, if you've been watching the screen as we've been going along. Some things coming up. There's the Space Drafts Public Talk Series, which is at Borderlands Brewery Company downtown. The next one in Space Drafts will be December 9th at 7.30. Dr. Jennifer Andrews from the Department of Astronomy talking about supernovae. And you can either bring your own food or come early and order pizza. There's another group that we uh, work with some, the Science Fiction Writers Group that works on uh, that meets on Saturday mornings at the Arizona Inn. Their next meeting is December 12th at 9 a.m. Uh, a couple more things from the Stewart Observatory uh, lecture series across the street. On November 30th, that's next Monday at 7.30, we'll have a talk, A Fusion of Art and Astronomy by Dr. Steve Strom, and he, he will be signing copies of his new book. And then on December 7th, the next week, Mark Sykes from the Planetary Science Institute will be talking about the latest reports from the dwarf planets Ceres and Pluto. And then next semester, a couple of things to note. We do not do our lecture series in the spring, in part because of the College of Science lecture series. It will be starting on Monday, January 25th at 7 p.m. This year's theme, it will be running roughly once a week. I don't know the exact dates, uh, how many we weeks it will be running this year, but it's Monday nights uh, through February. And this year's uh, theme is climate change. And if you are interested in going to that, those start at 7 p.m. And you need to get there early because, they're, oh, and they're at Centennial Hall. You need to get there early because Centennial Hall will be packed. Um, and finally, one other thing to mention is that Stewart Observatory and the U of A Poetry Center will be having an event on January 15th um, on Edgar Allan Poe and astronomy. Um, it will be at uh, Stewart and at the Flandreau Science Center. So, geez, you know, we co-sponsor something with the Poetry Center, and then they have to co-sponsor something with the Poetry Center. I don't understand. Um, tonight's lecture is going to be by Dr. Christopher Hamilton, one of our uh, newer faculty members. Uh, Christopher got his bachelor's at Dalhousie University and then got his PhD at the University of Hawaii, did a postdoctoral fellowship at Goddard Space Flight Center, and then has been with us for a year and a half, roughly. And tonight he'll be talking about volcanism on Earth and Mars. Okay, thank you very much for bearing with me with some of the technical issues here. I was trying to do something fancy and show some video as well as uh, the regular PowerPoint presentation. So I'll just start this and I'll fix my microphone as I go here. But this is, um, well, it's a kind of, kind of curious thing, but you'll, you'll see in a moment. Okay. So this is uh, some UAV footage of a location in Iceland where we spent quite a bit of time this summer. And so we're actually flying over part of the Lockheed Fisher, which I'll talk about more in the main presentation, and looking at some extremely unusual structures, most of which are related to the eruption actually coming through a waterlogged area with a lake as well. So in the background you can see this, this large structure, which is uh, a tooth cone produced by a magma water interaction, and in the foreground, a different kind of explosion uh, that's been created by lava moving over uh, a bog and then generating a rootless eruption. So we'll just take a moment to be able to admire the view, and as we go through the presentation, you'll understand why this very unusual place in Iceland is so important for studying Mars as well. Okay, hopefully that's working a bit. Ah, I'll just have to hold it, I'm afraid. Okay, 
So uh, at this point, we're actually moving up. The initial footage was taken um, using this uh, quadricopter, a drone, which was at about 30 meters, and now we're rising up to about 100 to 150 meters, and uh, facing in this direction towards a series of old hyaloclastite ridges. This is a type of structure produced when a volcano erupts under a glacier, and this fissure is part of the Lockie eruption from 1783 to 1784. It actually extends 27 kilometers towards a glacier in the background, Vatnajökull, which is the largest glacier in Iceland. And all around it, this enormous area, now covered in moss, is part of the Lockheed uh, lava flow, which covers about 600 square kilometers. So throughout this area, there are just phenomenal uh, structures. And one of the interesting things about this area is that the lava, the eruption was so large, it filled an entire valley before moving down a series of um, river gorges, and then finally reaching the uh, coastal plains. So the video goes on for a while, but I'll, as soon as we get to a, uh, finish the rotation, I'll move to the main presentation. Well, the UAV technology is actually quite a fantastic thing to be able to use. It's a little difficult, unfortunately, in the United States, but the Icelandic government's been very supportive of letting us test out these types of uh, imaging platforms for our, our work. Let's see. Worst luck ever with the microphone. Yeah. Test. All right, this works better, I think. Thanks. All right, so one of the uh, interesting themes throughout the work are these different exotic environments on Earth that provide us with a rare window into the different types of planetary processes, in particular volcanic processes that are operating on uh, the, the terrestrial bodies throughout the solar system. And most of my work focuses on comparisons with Earth and Mars, but also some of the other planetary bodies as well. So this is one of my favorite uh, images. It's uh, one of the 100 greatest photographs of the 20th century, according to Time magazine, and it shows a volcanic eruption in Iceland. But it also shows a lot of other things, and I'll just bring your attention to a few of them. So the, uh, in the background, the glowing light is coming from the Hekla volcano. And the Hekla is a very famous volcano in Iceland, and it erupts quite often, and is a very distinctive one with a large uh, snowpack that occurs on the surface. And so this is another example of a location where magma water interactions are quite common. You can also see the lava flow is moving down onto the foreground, but you also see these other connections. So a volcano is a conduit which brings heat from the interior of the Earth to the surface, but that internal heat has a lot of other factors too. One of them is to be able to generate, uh, at least on, on Earth, a magnetic field, which interacts with a much broader connection with the solar system, producing distinctive aurora. And then, of course, in the background, all the different stars, each of which, as we're beginning to understand better and better, contain other Earth-like worlds and many other exotic planets as well. So in the solar system, there's a, a large number of bodies that exhibit uh, many styles of volcanism. On one end, you have silicate volcanism, which in involves magmas as we typically would understand them, produced by molten rock. In some other exotic environments, like Enceladus and Pluto and uh, Europa, there are other forms of volcanic activity where the magma is actually a cryomagma. It's an ice or a water instead of um, a silicate like it is on the Earth. So the Earth and, and our, our closest neighbor, Venus, and this is an example of some of the volcanoes seen in a radar projection, um, includes all sorts of dramatic landforms. Now, unlike Earth, which is very paradise-like in the solar system, Venus is uh, just absolutely dreadful. So with a pressure that's almost 90 times higher than the Earth at sea level and temperatures of about 470 degrees Celsius, completely un inhospitable, in part because of the release of enormous greenhouse gases from volcanic activity throughout its history. So other bodies throughout the solar system have different styles of volcanic activity, and Mercury is a wonderful example with huge flood lavas, much like the Lockheed eruption, but so much larger, occurring in the northern part of the planet. Another really interesting one, do you have my mouse? Do, do, do. So this is one of the moons of the outer solar system, uh, Io. And there 
here you can see uh, an explosive eruption with a plume extending almost 300 kilometers into, into space, and that's the Tavashtar volcano. And this is a montage that was created by the Lori camera when New Horizons was on its way to Pluto. Now, in between these two, and encompassing both explosive volcanism and flood lava volcanism, is Mars. And this is an example of some of the Tharsis Montes, the largest of which is uh, Olympus Mons, which reaches about 25 kilometers in height. So that's about three times taller than Mount Everest, measured from sea level to, the, to its very summit. So one of the reasons why volcanic activity on Mars is so fascinating is because of the intricate history that Mars has had, including a number of different fluid flows water, and also lava. So one mission which went to Gusev Crater was a spirit rover, and there's this large sinuous channel that extends into Gusev Crater, and it was thought that this would certainly be a great place to look for lake deposits, sediments that have been transported by water. Instead, on the surface, what was typically found were piles of lava, um, in this case, a basaltic or mafic uh, lava, and this was kind of typical of most of the surface of, of Gusev Crater, indicating that had there been a, a lake previously, it had been resurfaced by lava afterwards. So dragging the wheel, there were also a number of other uh, surfaces that were exposed. In this case, a lot of sulfates and other indications of hydrothermal activity, which could be generated by a combination of heat from a volcanic source and from uh, water located within the structure. Another thing that was identified in quite an iconic picture is this structure where you have these fine layered sediments and bombs present within it. And this is typical of what's called a surge bed where you have a magma water interaction generating highly explosive uh, layers of material or tephra that then can have blocks falling into it. Okay, so this sort of comes to what my favorite style of volcanic activity is, and that's magma water interaction, as you may have guessed. So this is an example from the Eiffel at the Yukult eruption in 2010, which was quite dramatic and affected air traffic because of the inclusion of water affecting the fragmentation processes of the, the magmatic system. A precursor to that eruption was the Fimfelderhaus eruption, where lava poured over snow. And this is remarkably important for understanding Mars, where most of the water which is interacting with the volcanic systems is present as water or ice in an ice-bearing permafrost. So this is quite a good analog for it. Other environments uh, in, in Iceland that have a lot of relevance to Mars are these, these uh, ephemeral hydrothermal systems. Heat, which is transported from the lava to the surroundings, can generate relatively short-lived but very regionally extensive hydrothermal fields that could support life. Um, additionally, and this is an example from Kilauea, when lava encounters water, it can crack the water into and salts as well into a variety of exotic compounds. This is an example from White Island where you can see a lot of the interaction with seawater producing extremely exotic chemistry, which potentially could harbor extremophile forms of life as well. And my favorite, again, the uh, volcanic rootless cones, which are these products of explosive lava water interactions. And this is an example from the Lockheed Lava Flow. So to understand the uh, similarities and differences between our planet and uh, mainly in this presentation, I'll talk about Mars, but a little bit uh, at the end about the Moon as well. Um, there are kind of three dominant environments where we have volcanic activity on the Earth. The first is along plate boundaries, or subduction zones, where material from the uh, surface of the Earth is descending or subducting into the interior, heating and generating magma, which rises to the surface to produce volcanic eruptions. Another type, like we saw in uh, Iceland, is forming at a different type of plate boundary, a, a, a rift boundary, in this case the Mid-Atlantic Rift, which is exposing uh, ma magma from the mantle at very shallow depths and feeding a lot of volcanic activity there. And the last one is the hot spot, which can occur either in a, uh, in an oceanic environment or in continental environments. And this is bringing magma from very deep sources in the interior through mantle plumes, where you form quite large and persistent eruptions. So Mars is quite, uh, quite different because it doesn't have these plate tectonic mechanisms that uh, affect the, the cycling of material on the surface. So here you can see the Tharsis Montes, the largest of which is uh, Mount, uh, Olympus Mons. And this entire area, about a third of Mars, is covered in, in uh, different types of volcanic deposits. 
Now, the other side of Mars, which people don't tend to look at as much, it doesn't have as much of a, a dramatic character, is characterized by this uh, volcano uh, and volcanic region called Elysium. And the interesting thing, and why this is one of my favorite parts of, of Mars, is that, and we'll see this later on in the presentation, this entire relatively smooth area is an enormous flood lava flow. In fact, a series of flood lava flows that have been produced in some of the youngest eruptions on Mars, and the youngest of which could be maybe five million years old, which in a geologic context is extremely young. So this area, the uh, Cerberus Plains, is an area that we'll look at quite a bit in comparing to flood lavas like the Lockheed eruption. So to help interpret what kinds of components are in a large flood lava flow, it's important to look at two of the end member lava flow types. And these words will come up quite a bit, so I'll introduce them in the beginning. So here we have a, a pahoehoe -hoy lava, and the other type is an a'a -a lava. And these are two words uh, brought into our, our vocabulary from uh, the Hawaiian language. And the typical characteristics of pahoehoe -hoy is that they have these lobate margins. They're fed by internal pathways like tubes and sheets and they're very efficient in terms of their thermal insulation. Uh, the difference in terms of AA is that they have this almost caterpillar-like uh, motion, and it's kind of a weird phrase, but picture a caterpillar, not like the little inchworm type, but a caterpillar track on a, on a tank or on an excavator where the material is moving forward, cascading to the front, and, and moving and advancing in that sort of rolling motion. And, and this is due in, in part to the fact that the lava is subjected to relatively high shear strain rates, which pulls it apart into these little clots, or, or uh, what it's often called clinker. And that means that it's very inefficient in terms of its thermal insulation, because it's being continuously disrupted. So if you were observing from a satellite, this would typically have a higher temperature than this one, because um, more of the materials, uh, the incandescent material is exposed to the air, whereas here it's actually insulated under a relatively cool crust. So in, uh, another way to be able to look at the differences relates to the generally higher viscosity, um, or generally lower viscosity for pahoehoe -hoy flows, and a generally higher viscosity associated with our uh -uh flows, and a generally lower shear strain rate. And so that's basically the force which is applied to the material, um, and a generally higher shear strain rate in this instance. And that's often because uh, RR flows have a much higher discharge rate. So the material is coming out of the ground with a fire hose with a lot more pressure. So that's helping to shear or disrupt the material and break it apart. So we can look at uh, ooh, some character conversions, but that's OK. I'm not sure what this symbol is anymore. It's supposed to be a question mark. Um, so we can look at uh, potentially two different end members of pahoehoe -hoy on one side and a-a uh -uh on the other. But does that represent the full spectrum of diversity? And I would argue not, and that there's actually another branch that we could consider. And a lot of the talk will actually focus on exploring that other dimension. Um, there are a whole series of uh, other transitional types that could be referred to as platy, slabby, and rubbly. And we'll look at examples of each of these that represent something different from a continuum between uh, pohoi hoi and a. Uh. So um, to be able to understand these differences and also the time scales of emplacement, um, I wanted to show you two examples. So the first uh, example here shows three different cross sections through lava flows shown to scale. A typical example of a pahoehoe -hoi lava in uh, Hawaii, which would be uh, on the order of two or three meters in thickness. The scale there is 2.7 meters. Um, and uh, in Iceland, the lava flows typically are much thicker and can reach heights of about 10 meters, in some cases a little bit thicker, but generally uh, you know, maybe four times thicker than the Hawaiian examples. The really large eruptions on Earth um, are called continental flood basalts, and they have occurred in places like the Columbia River uh, Plateau and the Deccan Traps and the Siberian Traps. And these flows are typically quite a bit thicker. Um, they can reach 18 meters thick in this cross-section, but in other cases, they can be almost 30 meters thick. And so how does the lava flow get to be that thick? What are the processes that control it? Well, in general, and this is an example from data in, in Hawaii, there, there are two main parts of the, the flow. There's a, a molten core, and there's a crust that's sitting on top. And you saw that in each of the initial examples with that incandescent material being molten, part of the molten core, and then a crust on top. And what often happens is that because there's a pressure control on this a molten core, it's like a hydrostatic uh, head will, uh, will lift uh, like a hydraulic jack, um, a fluid 
to an equilibrium height, after just a few hours, uh, well, a few, a few days, I suppose, you end up uh, achieving an equilibrium thickness in terms of the, the uh, hydrostatic pressure that's moving through that pathway to a particular point within the flow. That means that um, if you want to be able to get a thicker lava flow, you have to have time. And time is what controls the cr uh, growth of the crust. And in the beginning, it radiates a lot of heat to the environment. But after that, you have to conduct heat through. And so uh, I won't talk too much about these sorts of things. But there's a square root of time dependence, which means that the amount of material that you're adding over time decreases per increment of time. And so thick lava flows don't just represent larger eruptions. They represent much longer duration eruptions. The only way to be able to grow a crust, which in this case is extending from perhaps 8 meters up to 18 meters, is to be in, uh, in place in that on the order of many months to, in fact, years. And some of the examples from Mars, I would argue, actually form on the duration of decades, because the only way that you can get that kind of thickness is to be able to gradually creep crust to the top. Okay, so here are two different ty lava flow types. Uh, any guess what this one is in terms of our two initial end members? Uh, uh, yes, exactly. And and this one? Uh, All right. So this is one of the, the best examples I've, I've seen of just two flows right next to one another. Totally different uh, character and totally different appearance because one is actually quite a bit older than the other. And this is in the saddle between Mauna Loa and uh, Kilauea. So um, you can see here the flow is sort of moving as a series of little fingers that are protruding through, and then with time they thicken or inflate. And uh, here's an example of uh, uh in the bottom and pahori hoi forming uh, all around it. And so you could look at a structure like this and interpret that perhaps the surface had collapsed in, but in fact the surface was never covered. That older uh, uh flow is surrounded, and the surroundings actually inflated up. So initially you can see this little squeeze up. That's part of the hydraulic uh, lifting where the fluid is thickening and at sometimes breaking through the edges. But then after that, all the additional crust is accreted. It's cooling and it's being added. So this is a part of the flow that was active for much longer. These little toes didn't have a large through flow of lava and stagnated at a very early time. Okay, so here's a, another example. It might not look that impressive until you see a colleague, uh, Jake Bleacher from uh, G Goddard, standing there for scale. And this flow is about 15 meters thick. Uh, it's actually located in New Mexico and is the, one of the youngest lava flows in the United States. Um, it's about 2,000 years old. So this is uh, an example of some of the data that we collect when we go into the field. And uh, these are generated through data that I collected and, and have been post-processed post by uh, uh, another colleague, Stephen Scheidt, who at LPL. And this is uh, actually produced by photographs. It is a digital train model which has been produced from not one image, but thousands of images that are used to be able to reconstruct a scene. So this is what it would look like in a visible wavelength, and this is what it would look like as uh, a representation of height from 0 to 15 meters. And you can see these deep cracks that are extending through the crust. Okay. So uh, to kind of give you an idea of how large some of these can be, I think we've got a scale bar here that goes over to about 600 meters. This is a, a smooth, very smooth, flat-topped plateau. It has some of those pits, these lava rise pits or inflation pits. These are examples of what they look like. And this is uh, an example. It's actually not a photograph, but it's a series of points that are made by this um, uh, photographic technique I was describing. And you can see these little protruding uh, ledges that have been squeezed out as the surface has been lifted up and then the crust grows afterwards. And so this is indicative of an emplacement which would probably take a couple of years to be able to have a flow that is able to grow that thick by uh, accretion and, and conduction. Okay, so here's an example of a location in uh, Iceland, uh, in, on Mars, sorry, <laughs> where we've been looking at a much larger flow. This is a scale bar. It's 30 kilometers across. It's in that area that I described that I like so much, just a little bit uh, northeast of uh, Elysium Mons. Um, uh, Sarah Sutton has been helping as well to be able to generate these beautiful digital train models. And I apologize for not mentioning uh, this earlier, but our typical convention is when we show a digital train model, the cooler colors represent low elevation and the warmer colors represent high elevation. So these structures would be high and these would be relatively low. And so we can see some of these edges of the flow. And so let's look at some of them in more detail. 
So here's an example on the flow margin. This is one of these beautiful digital train models, low elevation and high elevation. And we can render that in a perspective view and actually see a lot of the same structures. This overall large lobate structure looks a bit to me like a banana with a, a fracture that runs along the, the, the top. And here there's a little impact crater that's excavated some uh, of the, the darker material. Everything else is covered in dust. So when we look at the thickness of this, it's actually about um, this section is uh, close to, I think, 40 meters thick. And some of the interior parts are 60 meters thick. And to go across that's on the order of 60 meters thick, that's the full flow, and usually uh, about a third of it is the crust and the other part is the core. Uh, you're looking at a scale of decades. It's a phenomenally long time. So there's some speculation that these large eruptions on Mars occur very quickly. Some people suggest on the order of several weeks. Um, and, but uh, I, I'm actually of the opinion that these kinds of, of structures, if they're produced by inflation and cooling, actually uh, uh, implies a much uh, longer duration eruption. Okay, so uh, a couple of other lava flow types. Um, so we talked a little bit before about how important channels are in terms of understanding um, Mars. And I just wanted to describe and show you a range of different channel types. So in the oldest era of Mars, which is called the Noachian period, um, there's ample evidence of surface flows of water either through uh, sapping or for pre precipitation that create these highly dendritic uh, tributary channel systems. This is a very, uh, I, th I think that there's a ample evidence to suggest that water was involved in, in those examples. In the intermediate part of Mars history, the Hesperian, there are these catastrophic outflow channels, these enormous areas that have these collapse zones at the top and then these huge erosional channels that extend out uh, afterwards. And there are a number of different theories of that, but they think uh, in, in general that um, there's a quite an extensive uh, aquifer, a global aquifer on Mars, and that periodically uh, it's, uh, it, it, the surface of it is uh, frozen and can crack and release enormous volumes of water onto the surface in this catastrophic flood process. Um, so these are enormous structures. You can see the scale bar there is about 30 kilometers across. Um, more highly debated, and I, I find quite more interesting in some ways, um, are these very young or Amazonian age channel systems in volcanic terrains. And some people point to them as being beautiful examples of uh, geologically recent uh, large aqueous flows of water onto the surface of Mars carving into the landscape. Um, and in some cases that may be, be true, but I'll show you some examples that I think uh, suggest that at least some um, are, are actually the products of uh, la lava uh, flows um, and are actually constructional. They, they don't erode into much of anything. So here's an example of one near Olympus Mons. This is a, a fissure. This is a digital train model where we're looking at um, a perspective view of a channel which is zooming off in this direction downslope. There's another little one that comes through here. And uh, typically rivers form in a valley. And, but here you can see that this zone, this deeply, um, what appears to be incised zone, actually is surrounded by a little high standing uh, collar or levee. So if we go back to some examples in Hawaii, we can help to understand this a little bit better. This is an example from Kilauea Volcano, uh, from 2007 actually. And um, there's a, a lava uh, flow that's coming through here. And um, you can see that there's sort of this triangular levied margin to it. And then there's this central sinuous channel in the middle. Now, if the, the eruption stops at a relatively early part, you can still see these edges. But if the eruption continues and continues and actually begins to flood a large area, it can be confined by the topography, much like that Lockheed elu eruption was that we saw in, in the first video, with uh, then a pathway forming in the middle. Now, if that pathway drains, you can be left with this curving uh, sinuous channel system that looks a lot like a river has cut down into the smooth plain, but is in fact the process of initial construction and partial drainage. And here's some examples of how that construction process works, and this is what the drained structure can look like. It's very river-like, and so between our two examples as well, what would you guys call this in terms of uh, our bahoy hoi? Yeah, it gets it gets harder, and uh, I'll show you some ex examples where where it gets harder harder still. So one of the uh, key types of uh, lava channel ha that I've been quite interested in is uh, what will be a tributary lava channel. Um, most lava channels are like this. It's an example from Mauna Loa. This is from uh, I think 1984. 
And um, the lava started out near a series of vents high on the flanks of Mauna Loa, and as it moved away from the source, it generally branched out. So this is a distributary channel. It's like a fan almost. Um, that's the way most lava flows work. Um, but in 1974, there was a different type of eruption that also started from a fissure. This is located in the southwestern uh, part of Kilauea volcano. And it, it was erupted into a fault zone and was very significantly confined by the topography. And all of these different branches actually began to form like a tributary system, like a river, a single branch that moved its way down. So if you can picture each fissure erupting a certain amount of fluid at a time, in this system, it would be diminishing as it branches. And in this case, the, the volumes of lava, the discharge rate that you have at a distance away from the source is actually increasing as more and more lava is actually feeding into it, just like a, a river like the Amazon. OK. Ooh, now some things have not turned out too well with the, the brightness here. But this is a, a map of Hawaii. And uh, in the southern part of Hawaii is Kilauea. And uh, this is uh, the, the southwestern rift zone of Kilauea. And the overall flow direction is down towards the sea. And um, this is an example of a, it's a hail shade, which means a synthetically illuminated digital terrain model from airborne LIDAR data. It's about a, a meter per pixel. And uh, I'll just draw your attention to this zone up here, marked in A, which is one area which I'll refer to as a pond, and B, the second lower uh, elevation area. And um, I, I liken this maybe because I'm, I'm Canadian to a, a beaver dam, where you have a, an upper uh, zone which has then been partially blocked by a, a leaky uh, barrier, in this case constructed by the lava flow itself, not little industrious beavers. But um, if uh, at a certain point the dammed lava becomes too great behind this uh, durable but still um, potentially prone to failure uh, dam, you can end up having a, a surge forward. And this actually happens a, a lot along river systems. And I'd argue that that's actually what's happening here. And this is a, a mosaic of images that we've produced using a kite. Uh, it's about 10,000 images. But as you can see, the lava is coming in. And th there's a rotation here. So north is kind of up in this direction. And uh, the lava is pouring into this pond. And then this is the leaky barrier and the leaky barrier. And then at one point, and I'll show you, this area actually fails. And this platy surface is produced as, imagine, a frozen lake. It surges forward and breaks into a series of, of, of large plates. And there's quite a bit of, well, there is um, at a stage some debate about whether or not there are remnants of frozen ice packs and stuff at mid-latitudes on Mars that was related to interpretation of features, which I would argue formed by this mechanism. OK, so here is an example from not this summer, but last summer in, in Hawaii. This is part of our, our field team that's gone out to this area. Um, this is an older surface, and this is the uh, lava flow from December 1974. And um, this is actually a digital reconstruction which we produced by making a digital train model from this almost 10,000 um, uh, kite-based images and then uh, draping that, uh, the visible imagery onto it. So to give you an idea of what this looks like in more detail, this is a little flow margin. This is part of our digital reconstruction. And uh, you can see here, and there's a scale bar here, um, actually individual footprints. And you can make out the difference between the heel and the, and the toe of it. So you have a resolution that's better than about 2 centimeters per, per pixel using this technique. So here's an example of an individual uh, kite uh, image. And um, this was collected by a kite system that Stephen Scheidt had d designed. And it was great to be able to fly it. Uh, the consistent trade winds actually made it very, very easy. And so we're looking down the, the, in the flow direction. And here's a digital uh, rendering of the same, same scene. And as a digital rendering, we have a number of things we can do with it. Uh, one of them is you can view it in any direction you want. It's not a single static image. We have these three-dimensional virtual outcrops that we can view in a variety of ways. And here is an older uh, structure. It's called a tumulus. And here you can see uh, almost like a bow wave, which has been generated by as the 1974 flow is deflected around this obstacle. And uh, as a, a teaser for other Mars-related things, this is an example from Railway Vallis, um, an area that uh, I believe is covered in, in, in lava, interacting with an older obstacle and producing this bow wave-like structure. Um, and this is what it looks like in Elysium. Um, and these large plates, which had been interpreted as frozen ice pack, uh, one series of papers, and um, it, these series of, of uh, elongated um, 
flow structures, which we actually do see in, in uh, terrestrial context. So again, as a, um, a digital train model and a synthetic product, you can uh, really ramp up the vertical exaggeration. And so here we're looking uh, towards the, the north, um, and we've increased the vertical exaggeration by a factor of eight. And this is the uh, inlet where lava is coming down and forming this river. And in the interior section of it, it's highly disrupted in a texture that would be quite similar to um, uh -uh. And along the edges, and it's, this is very saturated on the projector, um, you see a, a series of little lobes which are more pahoy hoy like And then this completely different texture in the middle, this, this uh, disrupted uh, platy texture. So this is looking, even with time, now times four vertical exaggeration, you can see how flat this, this pond is. Okay, um, This is an individual kite image looking straight down, and you can see the plates over here that are formed by sort of crumpled uh, pahoy hoy like crust, and they have, have uh, split um, and formed a series of separated plates, and then they've separated again as they've moved down towards what we'll see later is basically the uh, bathtub drain. And this is what the drain looks like. So first, the lava was moving out after it had been sitting for a while and formed a nice crust. Um, there was a, uh, we'll see a drainage event. It pulls away from the side and then begins to move down towards this point, producing these beautiful streamlined islands. And uh, some people believe that streamlined islands are uh, indicative of only uh, the erosion by rivers. And here we very clearly see an example within a, a lava flow. So here's another, this is still a digital reconstruction. Now we're viewing across the pond, and here are some of those bahoy hoy like margins. And um, this is um, it, it kind of an interesting way of being able to look at the data. This is called a, a point cloud. So if you want to represent something which has overhanging ledges, you can't fuse it into a flat image. So most of the time when people deal with topography, it's a 2 and a half d surface. It's really, it looks like height, but you can't actually represent uh, an overhanging ledge. So this is uh, part of our point cloud. We actually have a half a billion points in, in this data set. And um, to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, this is not a photograph. Each of these are individual vertices or points, and um, it's completely co-registered with uh, international data, and so we can actually look exactly at the heights. And this is showing a color ramp of two meters between the, the bathtub ring or the high stand and where it's begun to drop down in a continuous uh, event during that uh, dam breaching event. And here's a photograph, and you can see the crust. Uh, it's about 20 centimeters thick, which implies about 30 uh, minutes of cooling. Um, and then these little lava stalactites and these twin marks that indicate that the lava fell in a continuous fashion. So what we can infer from this is that the lava formed and filled this bathtub and was sitting there for about 30 minutes until that uh, beaver dam broke and the area actually surged down, dropping about three meters in a very short period of time and then uh, moving out. So here's the uh, a, uh, what's called an ortho photograph, or an ortho mosaic in this case. And what that means is we're looking at it as though we're looking straight down. So we've removed all the distortion, and every point has distortion-free as seen from uh, looking straight down. And this is where the lava comes in, these plates, and these, these two drainages. Very faint here, but you can see the outline of the flow in, in yellow. Um, outline of the channels in, uh, well, it should be blue, but it looks a little bit more like toothpaste. Um, a series of plate boundaries uh, that are marking the edges of those areas, and there's a section of slabby lava which is formed as these plates are racing towards the drain and uh, actually decoupling and crumpling um, to be able to produce that wake. And we saw a perspective view of that earlier, earlier on there. Okay. Uh, a few other Hawaiian words. This is an old uh, felt scarp. Uh, kapuka is a word in Hawaiian which means unburnt island in the lava. So these are areas that were never covered by this younger lava flow, and you can see some examples of them. And um, we have the lava pond, the inlet, one of the outlets, and another outlet over here. And in terms of our fasces, uh, or in, and that's a, a word that describes different regions of similar attribute, we have this sort of uh, -uh to rubbly zone. We have a series of pahoe hoi like uh, units, these uh, uh to rubbly like units. Uh, we have that bathtub ring, a platy surface, a slabby surface, and a series of streamlined islands. 
So uh, overall, if we return to this this kind of uh, uh, synoptic view, uh, you have a topographic confinement leading to the formation of a, a tributary channel network, which is quite unique among volcanic systems on Earth, where usually you fan out. But in fact, on uh, Mars is quite common, and uh, in the geologic record is actually more common on, on uh, Earth than we might initially suppose. And so the, the concentration of lava into these topographically confined basins forms a series of ponds, which then flow like water through a series of locks as they're overtopped, first filling and then spilling. And these are analogous to uh, environments on Mars producing both platy lavas and these sinuous channels within the, the connections between these zones. Um, so there was uh, an interesting, so this is a reconstruction that we have, even though the December 74 flow should have been very well studied, uh, actually occurred on New Year's Eve, and only two people saw it, and uh, it w I've spoken with one of them, and he said it was very beautiful, um, but it isn't very well described. Um, but in 2007, um, and it, this is uh, a location also in Kilauea, um, Matt Patrick, a former former office mate of mine in Hawaii, actually, but now works at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory, um, actually set up a series of cameras and saw this happen it, uh, actively. So there was a shield. So this is actually quite a bit away from the vent, but basically the lava has been building up a rampart which extends uh, tens of meters above the surroundings. And then uh, this is a, a scene taken at about uh, almost 11 a.m. in the morning, uh, close to 5.30 that uh, same day, um, there was a breach along the side, and all of a sudden, the stored reservoir of lava came surging forward. And as we saw initially, things like enhanced um, the shear strain rate can disrupt the lava flow and transition from being a regular pahoi hoi flow into an aa -ah flow. And this has nothing to do with the character of the eruption at the vent or change in terms of discharge rate. It's uh, due to the storage and, and uh, catastrophic release of lava within these uh, ponds. And so I think this is quite comparable to what uh, probably happened in the December 74 flow. Okay, um, so I'll just do two things. First, I'll just take a look at the time. Okay, so we're all right. Um, and uh, show a couple of examples from Iceland before uh, zipping off to, 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 to Mars. Um, so the two I, I mentioned before, uh, the Lockheed eruption, and uh, Holohern is a, a actually a brand new eruption. This one occurred in 1783 to 1784 and is the largest historic eruption in Iceland. Uh, Holohern started erupting last, uh, ju last uh, July and uh, finished erupting last February and is actually the youngest uh, eruption in, in Iceland, and also the second largest after Lockheed. is absolutely enormous, but it mainly formed lava flows, and at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some uh, footage of uh, our, our journey there this, this summer. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the Lockheed lava flow. We're looking out at that main fissure. Our first video was taken up here in the northern part of the park, and uh, here we're in the southern uh, half of the fissure. And um, this particular uh, zone, this is uh, Charnagigar, it's a, a, a lake within part of the cone row, and then there's this beautiful sinuous channel that extends out. And this is part of an air photo, um, and this is uh, an ortho mosaic which we made this time, not from using kite imagery. Uh, this one I think is about four or 5,000 images taken from uh, a series of UAVs. We actually had several of them working at the same time. And so this is basically, I, I would argue, uh, one of these ponds, which is then burst and drained out and allowed all of that lava which stored in this upper section to come racing down. And um, that uh, channel system we can actually trace out for tens of kilometers before it enters a river gorge. Um, this is not a, a, a single image. This is another one of these uh, perspective views of Char oh, oh, of uh, Charnagiger looking at all these little islands, and this is a, a projection or a digital reconstruction. And to give you a sense of scale, this little uh, wooden boardwalk's about a meter across. And uh, here's an example. It's a, a Mars context camera image for, from Mars, um, near Olympus Mars again. And you see a series of these little islands and these channels. We've looked at this one before in, in high-rise data. And uh, here's a high-rise uh, image, and I'll just mention high-rise is quite an amazing camera. It's um, uh, Alfred McEwen is the principal investigator of it in the building next door, and uh, it's managed out of, out of uh, the University of Arizona and has a resolution of about 25 centimeters per pixel. And um, here you can see these little uh, elevated, well, the illumination direction is, is here, but these little levees, uh, high-standing ones, and all these little islands, much like the Lockheed eruption. Um, 
So again, I think just other other evidence to suggest that we see this kind of sinuous channel forming in association with lava flows, and you cannot just look at some of these structures and think that it was carved by, by water. In fact, in this case, there's, I think, better evidence that it was produced by lava flows. Um, so I mentioned before uh, flood lavas. So to give you a sense of scale, you have the Lanky lava flow. Uh, it's just a couple hundred years old. It covered uh, almost 600 square kilometers. Um, it's a there's a reason why we wrote uh, 15 cubic kilometers in this way, um, so we can easily compare that order of magnitude to some of the large eruptions like uh, the Columbia River Basalt Group. So overall, uh, the total area, and perhaps more important, the total volume of um, the Columbia River Basalt Group is uh, four orders of magnitude larger than the Lockheed eruption. Um, but it's produced by many individual flows that are that are quite a bit smaller, and um, the average volume for most of those flows is uh, two or so orders of magnitude larger than the Lockheed lava flow. Now, if we go to Mars, um, the ages of the there are two main units of, of interest to me. One's the Cerberus Fossae two unit and Cerberus Fossae three unit. The, this nomenclature isn't as important as the age. Um, this uh, large flood lava is about 130 million years old. Um, compared to the Columbia River Basalt Group, which um, it, it was it occurred in a period of about 15 to 17 million years ago, um, but over a span of almost 11 million years. Um, on, on Mars, this one unit is about 130 million years old. The next youngest one is uh, less than 20 million years old. The youngest age estimates I've seen for parts of it are about a million, although I think the more believable ones are closer to five. Um, and if we just look at that order of magnitude again, the individual flow volumes for this this unit sort of range in at about 10 to the 4 cubic uh, kilometers. And uh, so it's about an order of magnitude larger than uh, the large uh, flood lavas on Earth. Enormously larger than Maki, but not that much larger than some of the largest eruptions on, on Earth. And in fact, some of the, um, the younger units, this is the one that's uh, perhaps five million years old, uh, are just a factor of two or so, not even an order of magnitude larger in volume. So Mars eruptions are huge by modern context on Earth, but not implausibly large within the context of what has occurred in the relatively recent past on, on, on Earth, um, basically less than 20 million years old, less than 20 million years old. Okay, so I, I mentioned before this very smooth, flat area, and this is a, a, a map I've been working on for way too long. Um, here's Olympus Mons, and here's Elysium, and that smooth, flat area that seemed to be covered in nothing is actually covered in, in one of the largest uh, lava flows, uh, in fact, a series of lava flows in the solar system. The northern part of it, about this section, is what's called the Cerberus Fossae II unit, but it does extend out and underneath this, and the younger one, the 21 year one, is sitting on top. And so, uh, it's, a, it's a long story, but, but uh, <laughs> there are also some tools to look at the stratigraphy, including uh, ground penetrating radar. Uh, but the, each one of the lava flows composing this unit is about 30 to 60 meters thick. That's kind of the typical range. And it covers, as an example, the uh, Cerberus Fossae 2 unit alone covers about 250,000 square kilometers, which is about the area of Mexico. And uh, we've been looking at it, 6 meter per pixel uh, image at a time, and uh, it's quite an interesting one. Okay, so let's look a little bit in the north. This is part of a geologic map that we've been, been looking at. Um, flow started here and moved north, but also part of it moved south. And as it did, it was confined by the topography into a series of narrow constrictions, and then fanned out when it got onto the lower plain. And this is the regional context for Lockheed. This is the 27 kilometer long fissure. It starts in this area, inundates all these little valleys, goes through these little constrictions, and fans out on the bottom. So those little constrictions in the Martian context are very hard to see. So this constriction goes across, it's just a couple of kilometers wide. And in fact, with lower resolution imagery, it's I impossible to be able to see. But this is a high, high resolution uh, image from the high-rise camera. And you can see these other structures Water-like, and if I think I'd, if I had showed you those sinuous channels before showing you the other examples of what you can have in a volcanic terrain, you would think that was carved by water. Um, but it's actually within a, a volcanic unit, and this is part of the, um, uh, the the lava flow. Here's what it looks like in a little bit more detail. Um, continuous along this whole area is a bathtub ring, and um, it overtops certain obstacles like this uh, crater. And then when that beaver dam broke and this flow moved through this constriction, the lava lava behind it dropped. 
and uh, sort of leaves a, 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 sk a skim of, of, of lava crust on the surface. And where the lava pours through these narrow constrictions, it breaks apart into a series of, of plates, much like we saw in the December 74 flow, these sort of rubbly transitional lava flow types. So um, <laughs> returning to the initial idea of Pahoehoe -hoe as one end member and uh, as the other, uh, we have so these platy lavas, these slabby lavas, and rubbly ones that in many ways indicate an increasing spectrum of disruption. And if we were to then put uh, on this uh, plot again, where we have Pahoehoe -hoe at one end with a stable crust, uh, uh, with a continuous disruption producing a, a, uh, a d disaggregated crust, the platy lavas form when the solid stable crust is disrupted during a single event, or, or, or two or so episodic events. Slabby lava flows are produced when this disruption process continues and the plates begin to separate and crumple. And in some instances, if you begin to crumple the plate sufficiently, you develop a, a, a rubble, which then be can become uh, an uh, uh So what is the kind of the key thing at this other corner? Uh, and I would say it's actually, instead of having a stable crust and a, di a continuous dis a disruption, it's an episodic disruption. And that's typically related to this fill and spill and placement process. Okay, um, a couple of other examples of what happens. This is a little bit of a departure, but in the beginning I suggested that volcanism isn't just silicate lava. It doesn't just involve volcanoes. In our traditional sense, we also have cryomagmas. Well, what about impact melts? What can they do? So a new project that just uh, was started about a month ago, um, this is an example from our pilot project, uh, uses a furnace at Syracuse University to be able to produce synthetic lava flows. And this shows the difference in character between these lobes and these very fluid lavas produced with just 50 Celsius difference in the temperature of the uh, furnace. And we can mel melt about a half a ton of material at a time and produce these synthetic flows. Why would we want to do that? Well, on uh, the moon as an example, an uh, in impact can actually melt part of the material and produce almost a wave of, of uh, ejecta that is pushed over the rim to be able to produce a, a series of uh, melt-rich uh, flows. And I'll show you a couple of examples of what they look like. This is part of a crater rim and a thin veneer of material, which then thickens as you get further away. Presumably, as the material cools and stiffens, it's able to exhibit some of these characteristics like inflation. Um, this is a couple of examples for very hot lava near the vent um, in different eruptions from Mauna Loa. And you can see that's a field book for scale. You can have lava flows that are thinner than uh, you know, just a few centimeters if the material is hot enough. So that's kind of like what the veneers are like. As you get further away and you begin to produce these uh, a more viscous material, you can produce a structure that begins to resemble bohoi hoi, in this case, the uh, example from the McCarty's. Um, this is a little bit hard to see, but the crater rim is over here, and these are a series of flows that are moving towards uh, the bottom of the image. And this is an example of uh, a, uh, a, a channel within a, a typical lava flow, um, so rather similar as well. And uh, we also can produce ponds in impact melts and some of these highly disrupted flows. In this case, uh, picture this pond feeding into this pond, feeding into this pond, producing episodic disruption and the formation of things quite similar to uh, our, our uh, platy lavas, um, but actually produced not because of a, a magma chamber and an internal heat, but external heat produced by an impact. And uh, here's uh, some examples of uh, our experimental setup, which shows the uh, formation of different lobes as we go. OK. So um, the last part, um, and if you'd like to see more pictures about this afterwards, you can go to our new website that uh, Joshua helped to set up. I'm not sure if he's I should be about some more. But anyway, thank you very much. And um, I'll show you some highlights of some of our, our work this summer. Uh, we'll start just with this. This is uh, our, our self, uh, I guess it's our selfie, um, but it's actually not taken with a regular camera. It's taken with a, a laser system. It's a, a terrestrial scanning uh, laser. And so these shadows are produced because our camera is emitting uh, several million pulses of light per second, and it's reflecting off of us and producing a synthetic shadow behind us. Okay, so um, this is what uh, the Holohan eruption looked like uh, last November. I was able to go out as part of an international monitoring team to be able to, uh, to study it. And at that point, it was um, 
this is probably about the size of a football field in this upper part, and it's a huge, uh, huge structure, uh, was emitting uh, an enormous amount of lava, and the overall amount is about uh, one to two cubic kilometers. We're still working out exactly how, how much lava was erupted, but it's the largest eruption in Iceland since Lockheed. Uh, this is, oh, it's so washed out. The vent is up here, spewing out all sorts of noxious gases, and uh, the lava is actually inundating uh, an old river system, and as it goes through that river system, it's boiling away the, the uh, old river, producing these steam plumes. And uh, at the front of the flow, uh, at the moment, this is an image taken from one of our, our UAVs, or one of the little drones, um, and unfortunately it's saturated, so you can't see the people swimming there, but maybe that's just as well. Um, there's a, a series of uh, hot, uh, uh, streams that are coming out because the river is still trying to get its way through this lava flow, but uh, wicking away the heat from the interior. And some of these little streams are so hot, these ones you can see, the, the steam coming off of them, they're about 50 Celsius, they're too hot to swim in. Uh, some of them are just perfect, they're about 40 Celsius. Um, but the remarkable thing is all of this s green and yellowy stuff is, uh, it's, it's all aquatic life. And this is an area, there's no typically hot springs or anything, but you put a little bit of hot water on it, and all of a sudden, incredible forms of algae, grasses uh, uh, have, have sprung up. So this in the context of Mars is, it, one could imagine if there had been forms of bacteria or basic life that had been accustomed to hydrothermal systems, put a lava flow onto uh, ice-bearing permafrost, create something like this, and uh, who knows what could happen. Um, this is an example of what it looks like on the ground, part of our, our team from uh, LPL, wading, wading through little streams. Um, we have a number of toys. This is a, a forward-looking infrared radiometer. It, it uh, is a, basically a th it, it measures temperature, and so we could make full temperature maps of the area. Um, and the journey to get there is quite a remarkable one. Um, this is what the Icelandic Highlands looks like, and this is basically what the area would have looked like as well before the, the lava flow came pouring on top of it. Uh, there are no bridges, so you have to drive through uh, relatively uh, challenging uh, rivers to be able to get there. Um, there's also a giant glacier that's in the background, washed out, but um, basically by 5 o'clock there's enough meltwater that's coming off of the, um, uh, through these, these glacial s streams that um, you can't cross, so we had to make sure that every day we'd keep a really good eye on how high the river levels were, and uh, always going with teams to make sure we didn't run into any trouble. Um, this is where we stayed. It's a Dreki, which means a dragon, and behind it is uh, the Askia. It's uh, one of the huge calderas in, in Iceland. It's actually one of the, the larger volcanoes. Um, this is our uh, tent city where we were. Uh, all the electronics lived in this little cabin that we stayed outside. A uh, logistical campaign to actually make sure everybody was able to eat when, when we came back, so, but we had uh, enough tools to be able to do that and had some, some uh, wonderful chefs and good company. And uh, this is uh, what the lava flow looks like. This is this brand new piece of the earth that ju just finished erupting in February. And uh, all sorts of interesting things. You know, this one might even be familiar. It looks uh, almost bahoy hoy like but it's actually quite spiny. It's a very interesting system. Um, and some of the tools we had. So uh, we had uh, our differential GPS. This is Ethan, one of the graduate students here. Um, Steve, our, our UAV and Kite Wizard with uh, our, our UAV. And um, a number of other people, Patrick from um, the Goddard Space Flight Center, and Inet, and uh, and um, uh, Elise from uh, Columbia University. So we actually had uh, 24 people in total this summer from 11 institutions that were taking part in these two campaigns at Lockheed and here. Um, remember that picture that I showed looking from the plane into the vent? This is what it looks like at the moment. And uh, you can see a couple of uh, intre intrepid uh, geologists walking through. Um, so uh, a couple of people from, again, Patrick from um, the Goddard, a uh, student, um, Jacob from the University of Southern Florida, and uh, I'm slowly converting over to a volcanologist. This is uh, Shane, who's a glaciologist, a uh, uh, glacial expert from uh, LPL. And so the, and this is uh, our uh, LiDAR, differential GPS, uh, high-resolution camera. And uh, sometimes this is me puzzled about what's actually happening. Uh, you just need to be able to get into the air. And so uh, this is a little uh, GIF, I guess, of uh, one of our UAV launches. This is the uh, lava flow in the background. We have a differential GPS there. And uh, up it goes. And uh, these are some examples of what individual stills, remember that the data products I've been showing you have tens of thousands of images that are fused together. Um, but this is an example of the surface of the lava, these platy surfaces beginning to develop. And that's our little group uh, for scale. 
uh, a couple of lobes on the ground. You couldn't really see any of these structures, but there's actually a suture. These are actually very different time eruptions uh, or, or s t portions of the flow, and they're actually several months apart, but um, they look almost indistinguishable from the ground, but you can see them quite well from the air. Um, again, some channel structures and polygonal structures. Um, all polygons on Mars don't need to be formed in permafrost. Um, other examples of plates. And, um, and sometimes the winds just got to be way too high, and so we'd have to do a little bit of uh, UAV falconry and catch uh, the UAV on the way down. Uh, and then the dust devils come in, and uh, no longer can we fly little, little drones. And, uh, but this is time for kites. And so uh, we use a, we've got a couple of different kites. There's one that's a nine uh, foot wingspan, and the one that's 11 uh, feet wingspan. And uh, up it goes into the air, and I don't know if we'll be able to see well enough with the resolution of this. There's a, a camera, there's a usually cord that comes down and, and a cross that we uh, mount the gimbals and stuff on. Um, but I don't know if you'll be able to see it. The camera's tiny in this, this field of view. So uh, also, besides research, lots of great opportunities to uh, begin developing new projects and, and teaching, and that was definitely a theme there. And this is uh, Sarah, who helped to make the DTM. She came to, to Iceland as well and able to uh, make, take lots of great notes and, and see a planetary analog site. And uh, we had some very good photographers that were able to capture some of the northern lights. And so I sort of began with the idea of the northern lights and connection um, to a uh, terrestrial uh, analog and how different aspects of our planet are connected to the sun and, and elsewhere. And uh, in the evening, you could definitely feel it. And um, so I we'll probably went a little bit over time because of uh, the, the uh, difficulty setting up. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. But also, if you have any questions, please uh, s feel free to send me an email. I'd be delighted to answer them. Thank you. Oh, um, in wh which which image? A lot of Mars images had a big black circle, kind of near the center. No. Um, if if you saw the 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 images don't usually have a, have a, a circle. It's, uh, Tim is suggesting Elysium Mons is the large volcanic structure, but if in individual images, I don't know if that was a, a rendering problem because there there really isn't a, you know shouldn't be a black circle in the middle. But. Yeah, I, I included in a number of them a uh, circle in a corner, which was a colorized Mars that showed the, oh, the black circle is the location in that hemisphere of Mars where that image came from. That's what that little black dot was. OK. So, yeah, I didn't know if you meant the, the main image, but in the inset, the black circle was the location within Elysium and Panisha showing where the image came from. Questions? So, what would we got, we got a lava flow. so, the question is what a, f a flow on Mars would look like relative to a terrestrial lava flow? Well, that's a good good question. Um, a lot of it depends on the scale uh, of the uh, water flow that's coming over. And so, uh, to give you an idea, um, we tried a little experiment, very s small laboratory scale one, of what happens with a small flow of water onto supercooled grounds. So we used a biofreezer and cooled the ground to about 80 uh, Celsius below and tried pouring water onto the surface of the sand to see whether or not you'd carve anything. Um, Again, I perhaps in intuition from growing up in, in Canada, if you pour water over frozen ground, you don't erode anything. You form a layer of ice, and you can make a hockey rink or an icing. And so it actually requires relatively steep slopes to be able to erode at all. Most of the time, you just degrade. Now, that's the small, small end. 
if you're dealing with these giant catastrophic er eruptions that are uh, comparable to things like the uh, Missoula floods or something like, like that, the Missoula floods uh, were related to these huge ice dammed uh, uh, lakes after the end of the last glaciation that breached and came through. These catastrophic floods produce things like the scablands. Those types of flows come through and, and erode everything out like crazy, um, but then can get captured in topographic constrictions and cut down. And they will also tend to fill up entire impact craters, find a breach point, and keep cutting down. So um, sort of picture draining out the Great Lakes, um, you end up having an enormously erosive uh, f flow. So you might find some ice on the surface of it very quickly, um, but, but basically the, the flows would be moving over and extremely erosive. They wouldn't look like a typical river on, on, on Earth that's gradually feeding in and continuing to extend over um, stable floodplains. They, most of the time with those big eruptions, if you're releasing water stored in, in the interior onto the surface, picture pulling the, the plug on, on a, one of the Great Lakes and uh, enormously erosive. So there's this full spectrum between very small seeps of water that probably wouldn't do much of anything except form ice or boil away to these extremely large erosive events. So what does that look like relative to lava? Well, I think that in most cases, lava flows aren't torrential floods of, of lava that come out of the ground as had been produced or speculated at one point for the Columbia River basalts where people thought, well, the only way you could get all the way down from the source to, to, to the sea would be to do it very quickly, otherwise you would cool it through. But the reality is if you, cr if you create a, a solid crust on the surface, you, you can actually thermally insulate and pump lava through almost as far as you want. I mean, it, it cools less than a half, even in Hawaii, half a degree per kilometer. So you could have very long-lived eruptions that are producing pahoehoe-like flows, but I think the key difference in why they look so similar to catastrophic floods is that the lava flows aren't confined as they are in Hawaii by themselves, these little, uh, little lobes. They're so big they flood an entire area and they can become much, much thicker than they would be under equilibrium conditions. So they're filling an entire valley, uh, much like water could fill an impact crater, and when it reaches a point of breaching, the discharge rates that you would have when you pull the plug on this huge surface reservoir of lava are orders of magnitude larger than what you would have from the vent. So you might take years to fill. Some of these areas that we've seen cover maybe 30,000 square kilometers. That's all covered in, in, in lava, and we see that that section is drained down about 8 meters. When you do something like that, you produce a catastrophic flooding event, but a flood lava that might be much more similar to what catastrophic aqueous floods look like, which is why there's so much confusion as to, oh, it looks like it's eroding. It's because you're temporarily storing and releasing, and that storage and release can create much higher discharge rates than you ha would have from the edifice itself coming up from the interior. Okay, so the question is, how well do our small experiments scale to the much larger eruptions on Mars? Um, so I guess to, to start, we're, we're actually using basalt. Uh, we shipped out tons of basalt from, from Hawaii, and we're not using s steel. Uh, for our, our lunar experiments, we use lunar simulants that are very similar in their, their chemical composition to the, to, to, uh, the moon um, as, as well, different sections of the moon. Um, small discharge rate pahoe hoi flows, uh, who, when we have made our measurements in, uh, in the field, have discharge rates of about, um, let's see, uh, that are about an order of magnitude larger than what we can do during our pour. Now, this is for like the small little ones that, that form around Kilauea. If any of you guys have been to Hawaii, you can walk on it, you can step on these little lobes. So we're actually able to get very close to, the, to that scale. Um, and a lot of the similarities that we see in terms of cooling rate, texture, lobe formation, and so on is, is extremely similar. What's very different is the flows that we produce actually form almost pure glass because when we put them into the crucible, we've superheated them. 
And so it actually changes the overall, not the composition, but the componentry of the material. It's very hard to make crystals. So that's why we decided to go to the impact melt section, which was probably the pure melt would have been superheated and be more similar. And a lot of the samples from the moon actually suggest that impact melts are very glassy. So there are some things that we can capture, and that's the very low discharge and number and be within about an order of magnitude relative to eruptions in, in Hawaii. But they're very short experiments. We just take this whole crucible and this half a ton of material comes dumping out within you know, 30 seconds, 90 seconds, something like that. So we, we can only really see what happens with the melt, not the full cooling and formation of crust. But it does tell us something and in, 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 in a way that actually is almost impossible to do in the field. And I'll just, the, the last part of that is we are able to use our thermal cameras to look at the, the surface and to be able to do video tracking of the motion of the flow. We also pour it over a system that includes a series of temperature, basically thermometers in the ground. So we tried making a whole series of little boxes before and gone out to Hawaii and tried to put these boxes in front of where we thought the uh, lava would go. And uh, we just were never able to, to do it. And the instances when they did, it just melted all of our cabling. It was just, it was a mess. So, so we do lose certain aspects of scale, but we do capture something that's similar to the low discharge end number in an environment where we can much better characterize our observations to be able to help uh, uh, test the models that we're making. That if we can predict at that smaller discharge rate, uh, we at least have some hope of validating them and extrapolating to higher discharge rates. But it's, it's imperfect. But if we get a bigger furnace, maybe we can get closer.